Hello, and welcome to Grug Gaming, and welcome back to our playthrough of Dominions 4. In our last episode, we created our pretender god, and went ahead and generated our new world. Now that we're into the actual world, let's talk about what we're looking at, go over some of the buttons on the screen for everybody watching at home, and talk about our nation. So as you look at the map, you'll see that it's divided into several provinces, and each one of these provinces is a territory we're going to want to be conquering throughout the game. You'll notice that right now we have our home province selected, and in the upper left-hand corner you can see the information about our province. We see the name of the province we're in, its population, how much money we get every turn from this province, and then how our scales, those options we decided for our god at the beginning of the game, are affecting us. The next thing you'll see in the center is the information about us. It shows the name of our god, it shows how much money we have in our treasury, how much we're spending on our troops, and what our total income is from our provinces every turn. You'll also see that up here in the right hand corner we can see it's spring in the first year of the Ascension War. Every turn is going to be a month as we play through the game. On the left you'll see all the troops in the province we currently have selected. In the main map area, you'll see the province we have selected blinking, and you'll see the lines heading out from it. These are the lines and direction of travel for any troops in that province. On the right-hand side of the screen is where we find all of our menu options. We'll start at the top and work our way down real quick here. First, we have the end turn button, which will move us to the next turn. Then we have the game options. Map filters lets us turn on and off things like the flags, so you can see that our province flag is now gone. We're going to leave those on pretty much the entire game. We can look at some statistics for the game, which we'll take a look at later. We could read the messages from the previous turn, as you can see. If we were in a multiplayer game, we could send messages to other players. Next up, we have some controls for our magic. We can go ahead and conduct our research underneath this tab, see what global enchantments are having an effect on the world, take a look at what our magic resources look like, magic gems that we'll collect to craft some of the more powerful spells in the game, and we can take a look at the magic items that our country has developed. Below that we have the options to create, control, and recruit our military. We'll be going through these next in a tiny bit. And then we have any special sites or locations in the province we have selected. So here, in our home province of Ermor, you can see that we have some fortifications. These give us extra protection. They give us a place for our troops to stay if we get invaded. It also increases the amount of income we get in this province. Any province that has a fortification built in it will draw income from the surrounding provinces and increase the tax rate for what you get. This province also has a laboratory. The laboratory allows us to develop specific magic units in that territory. The temple gives us uh, not only access to some of our holding units, it also uh, causes our dominion to spread out from this territory. And last but not least, there's a special site here called the Temple of the Shroud. You can see the Temple of the Shroud lets us recruit some specific units. It also gives us some magic gems every turn. So in our province right now, we have a couple troops already. We'll zoom in a bit so you can see them. We have a couple units here, and you can see that we have two leaders. The first one is a Centurion, a basic leader for combat troops in our armies. And the second one is a Scout. The Scout has the ability to travel across the map undetected most of the time. And you can see that our Scout has some other special abilities right here. He has Mountain and Survival and Forest Survival. This allows him to move farther in mountain and forest regions. Let's go ahead and take a look at the other units we can recruit for our army. We're going to do that by going to recruit units here at the bottom. And these are all the units we have available for recruitment in the territory we currently have selected. Let's run through our commanders first. The first commander available to us is the scout. Again, he has the ability to move far across the map, as well as being stealthy, which means it's difficult for the enemy to detect him. 
Here you'll see the main stats for the scout. The human average for most items is going to be 10, so we can see that our scout is pretty much average across the board. Let's run through these stats real quick so that we know what we're looking at when we look at other menus. This is how much our scout costs us in gold. The hit points are the same as in most other games with hit points. It's how much damage the scout can take before he dies. The protection is how much physical protection the scout has when he gets hit. Magic resistance, how resistant this scout is to being affected by magical spells. The morale on the scout dictates at what point he runs away from battle, and it also controls his ability to line up in formations in certain armies. The resource stat is how many resource points the scout cost us. His strength, of course, affects how much damage he does in physical combat. The attack skill of the scout is what measures if he can or cannot hit an opponent in combat. His defense skill is what is used by the game to dictate whether he is hit by a physical attack. And his precision is how precise his ranged attacks are and how accurate he is. On the right we have information for his encumbrance. Encumbrance is increased by units that have heavier armor, and the more encumbrance you have, the more fatigue you build up every turn in battle. Fatigue is a measurement of how tired the unit is, when a unit reaches specific levels of fatigue, it becomes unable to act in battle and becomes easier to hit. The movement down here shows how far he can move on the world map and per turn in combat. And his leadership stat shows us how many troops he can command. Being a scout, he can't command any troops. His job is to run around solo on the map and just get us information. Next up, we have the assassin. We won't be recruiting these guys very much, but we may use them a little later on. The Assassin is very similar to the Scout in abilities in that he is also stealthy and able to sneak through the enemy territory. But what he can also do is we can point him at an enemy leader and attempt to kill that leader, causing havoc in the enemy's armies. Next up, we have our Centurion. Again, we already have one of these to start the game, and this guy is a general troop leader. Now you'll notice that in his leadership stat he has an 80. That means he can control 80 units inside his army, but it also means because he has an 80 for uh, leadership that his units get a morale bonus of plus one for up to three squads. This is going to be important for us throughout the game because when units morale drops to zero during a, a battle, they run away and they could easily be killed. You'll see next, above him, is our next level up, the Legatus Le Legionis. And the Legatus has a slightly higher leadership and slightly better stats across the board. The Legatus Legionis is a high commander of an Imperial Legion. Only the most able commanders are chosen for the task, and only candidates with political backing, strong personalities, and exceptional skill will receive the honor. These able men command great respect from their soldiers and will inspire them to great deeds. As we can see here, better stats than what we see in the Centurion and a higher leadership. This unit can control more squads and it has the higher morale bonus for each squad he controls. Next up, we have our Acolytes. And these are our low-level priests for our nation. You'll see that they have a stat here, Priest Level 1, and the Sacred stat. This allows them to cast Level 1 Priest spells in battle, to also build temples for us, and if they get blessed, they get that bless bonus if we add specific magic to our god. Acolytes are lowly priests of the new faith. They are sent to small parishes and are rarely allowed to lead soldiers. Leadership 10 means that we can send a couple guys with him if we need to, but he's not going to be faring anybody around the map. Next we have the Augur. The Augur is our lowest level mage. You can see here in its stat line that it has one level of fire magic, one level of astral magic, gives us nine research points when we have the research, and is a little resistant to fire. 
The auger also has a great skill called Fortune Teller. What this skill does, it allows the auger to predict and help prevent bad, misfortunate events that may happen in the territory it's in. Augurs are soothsayers and seers who use flames and incense to foretell the future and the will of supernatural forces. Augurs are skilled in fire and astral magic. Beyond that, we have the Augur Elder. The Augur Elder is a much more powerful mage than the regular Augur. You can see beginning, the Augur starts with two fire, one astral, two death, and if we see this question mark, this means, if we click on it, that the Augur also has a 100% chance of having an extra level in any of these four types of magic, and then a 10% chance of having an extra level in these four types. What that means is that there is a 100% chance to gain an extra fire, astral, death, or air, and then on top of that a 10% chance to gain another level. This means that we could have a level 4 death auger if we get lucky. The auger when they research also give us 17 research points. They're also resistant to fire. And they're a fortune teller. Again, they can stop bad things from happening. Now the auger, however, being an elder, also has the old age stat. What that means is that the auger is going to every turn have a chance of gaining afflictions because of old age and could die. So we need to keep that in mind when we're investing in these characters. The Augur Elders are masters of augury. Their skills are considerable and they guide emperors and generals alike. But they are rarely trusted. Recently they have become even more secretive and rumor has it that they have divined the end of the Empire. The Elders have sent several expeditions to the ancient kingdom of Satis to find an old path of magic that will lead the Empire to world domination. Next up we have the Bishop of the Sacred Shroud. This is our next holy unit for a leader. You can see that this is a level 2 priest, also has that sacred ability, and then here are some great abilities, the recuperation and healer ability. What these do, this means that this unit is able to heal itself from battle afflictions. If it gets hurt, loses a limb, um, it is also able to heal its own diseases. And Healer 1 means that it heals one level of disease or affliction from any of our troops in the same province. Bishops of the Sacred Shroud are religious magistrates of the Awakening God. They wear holy replicas of the Sacred Shroud of the Prophet. Their sacred piece of cloth gives them unsurpassed healing abilities, and they have all but replaced the Flamen as priests in the Empire. Finally, we have the Archbishop of the Sacred Shroud. So a level 3 priest, able to cast even more powerful spells, sacred, has the ability to heal itself of afflictions or damage, also is a healer 1 so it can help the other troops in the same territory it is, but suffers again from old age. And you can see down at the bottom of the screen where it says old age 90, that means that 90 is considered old age for this character and it's going to begin on average about 96. And every year beyond the old age category, there's a better chance that this unit will just die. If we look here, the Archbishop of Elder Gate are the highest ranking priests of the Awakening God. They wear holy replicas of the Sacred Shroud of the Prophet. This sacred piece of cloth gives them unsurpassed healing abilities, and they have all but replaced the old pontifices as religious magistrates of the Empire. Those are the leaders that we can recruit. Next up, we have our basic troops. First, in the line of basic troops, we have the Slinger. Basic human stats, a little low on the attack and defense skill. Slingers are cheap missile units, they are not very accurate or deadly, and they are not good melee units. Then we have several versions of very similar units. We have the Levy, the Ankensis, the Roraris, the Hastatus, the Principe, and the Triarius. I'm going to mispronounce those the entire Let's Play, just so you know. Basically, as we move up through these units, you'll see similar stats, but a change in the defense skill, protection, and what weapon they're equipped with. 
The levies are Imorian skirmishers armed with javelins and spears. They initiate the engagement by throwing javelins at the enemy. The Accenti are quickly levied troops and militia. They are often placed in the rear where they are out of the way. The Rorari are young soldiers not yet experienced enough to join the Hastati. They are often placed behind the Terrari where they should be safe. The Hastati are the basic units of the Amorian army. They form the first line and will bear the brunt of the enemy attack. They are armed with a sword, javelin, and tower shield. They wear the Lorica Hamata, a light version of the Marverni Chainmail. The Principe are elite warriors and form a second line behind the Hastati. If the Hastati fall, the Principe will deal a second and decisive blow against the enemy. They are armed as the Hastati, but wear the thick-scaled Lakori Squamata. The Trarari are the last defense of the Legionary Army and form the third rank of the formation. They are hand-picked old veterans trusted not to rout. They are given heavy plate armor and long spears and fight in dense formations. The Trarari have great morale, but they are older and weaker than most soldiers in the legions. We're going to be focusing mainly on recruiting the Hastatis as our main unit in our army. The Hastatis has good defense skill, good protection, a javelin that it can throw at the beginning of battle as it charges the enemy, and a short sword that does slash or piercing damage against our enemies. As we get more and more money, we're going to start replacing those with the Principes in our army, but for the meantime, this is going to be our main unit. This right here, the, the Rararis, carries a spear and can attack from farther away, but the lower defense skill means that they take hits more often. Next up we have some specialized units. We have the Standard. Standard bearers are prominent soldiers entrusted with the care of the Standard. Standards are important to the morale of the legions and their presence will strengthen the spirit of nearby soldiers. Each one of these that we put in a squad will increase its morale. The Lizard Auxiliary. During the subjugation of Satis, Lizard soldiers were recruited into the Amorian ranks. Lizard Auxiliaries have since been a regular part of the Amorian army. The Lizards are armed as the Hastati, but wear ringmail curious of Satisian design and use round shields instead of the tower shields standard to the Imperial Legions. These units are very close to what we can get out of the Hastati, but you'll see that they are able to travel through swamps. They're also cold-blooded and poison-resistant, so they can be used in specific circumstances to aid our army in certain terrain. You'll also notice that they cost 10 gold and 11 resources, and our Hastatis costs 14 resources. So if we run out of resources, we can build a little bit more of these if we need to. The Equates, these are our go ahead and uh, be our cavalry for our main armies. The Equites are nobles who have joined the Amorian army. They wear the scale Loricos Clementa and are armed with a long sword and a light lance. Very good stats on this unit, but also a very expensive unit to create. We won't be using these for a while in our army. We have a Rotarius and a Gladiator available. These are slave units for the Empire. Gladiators are slaves trained to fight in the arena for the Emperor's pleasure. Gladiators who survive become very skilled in combat and often use exotic weapons. In times of crisis, they can be used in warfare in return for their freedom. They are quick to levy, but will only fight one battle before leaving. Same information here as well for the Gladiator. These units are much less expensive for us to recruit and if we need them in a in a pinch we can order a bunch of them but after they fight once we'll lose them from our army so we won't be using them much either last up we have the equite of the sacred shroud this unit is a sacred unit so we can bless it to give it bonuses it also recovers from afflictions and diseases on its own equites of the sacred shroud are sacred champions of the new faith each of them wears a white replica of the sacred shroud worn by the prophet shrouded in white. The blessing of this sacred cloth grants them unsurpassed healing abilities. They are among the most respected cavalry units in the world of men. Very good defense skill, great protection, 
these are units that last quite a long time, and because of their recuperation, when they do take damage, they're able to heal it after the battle. The only problem is they're very expensive for us to build. We will not be building them very much to begin with either. So let's go ahead and start recruiting some units for our army. We're going to recruit a Augur Elder. You can see that she is slow to recruit, and that means she'll take two turns to come into the army. And we're going to spend the rest of our money recruiting Hestatus. We're going to leave this leftover gold in our treasury and use that at a later turn. Because we're just building our army up, I'm also going to repeat this next turn as well. Let's go ahead and add some names to our two new soldiers that he gave us to begin the game. We talked about these last turn, last episode, and I'm sure you thought I was joking. But here's Bob. And here's his more famous brother, Bill. So to end this first turn, we're recruiting some troops. We're going to go ahead and leave Bob here in the main town. And Bill, we're going to send off to scout. I'm going to go ahead and select Bill and send him off to the left here. Bob, we're going to give a special order. Bob is going to become the prophet of our nation. He's going to become sacred, and he's going to gain some special abilities that we're going to talk about in the next episode of Let's Play Dominions 4. Thank you very much, and we hope to see you next time on Krug Gaming.